Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tessa Ott. I am the Biological Science Assistant in the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, stationed in the Dalles. Um, I started with ODFW as the um, pond turtle intern, so I've been working with them all year. Um, I was asked to come back on um, as the BSA, so I've been working with this species for a little bit. I've also worked with um, Washington population as well. So I'm pretty passionate about this species. All right, so I'm just gonna be kind of going over what we did this year and what we've been kind of doing in past years and um, what we found in terms of population and their habitat use and specifically their relationship to oaks. There we go, okay. Uh, so I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about the species. So the Northwestern Pond Turtle is um, one of two native freshwater turtles in Oregon State uh, and has been identified as a top five priority um, species by the conservation program within the East Cascades ecoregion. Uh, the species is also currently under federal re review to be listed under the ESA. It is the most northern and the most eastern population in Oregon, um, so it differs from every other uh, population in that the climate is drier, and not all um, ponds are permanent, so they don't have access to year-round aquatic habitat. Pond turtles are long-lived and have been documented to live to 30 to 40 years old. Um, however, accurately aging the turtles requires biological sampling and hasn't really been done in this specific population in Mosier. Um, but we do use kind of a, um, a kind of used method using the annuli on their um, classroom. So due to the long lifespan, they're not sexually mature until about seven to 10 years old, kind of on the later set usually. Um, so it's kind of important to note because successful recruitment into the population is slow due to those um, seven to 10 non-productive years and their physical vulnerability during this time. Um, after the first three years of life, survival does significantly increase, so that's good for them. Um, they are highly terrestrial and most of their significant life stages occur on land. So they nest on land and they spend um, the first three to nine months of their lives as hatchlings on land within or in close, close proximity to their nest site. Um, they also estivate and overwinter on land. So the, the turtles rely on their environment to thermoregulate. Um, so this requires them to estivate or hibernate. Um, this is done by burying themselves in um, dense ve vegetation or other substrate. Um, just kind of a note, estivation and hibernation are both kind of states of dormancy with different initiators. Um, estivation is heat initiated, whereas um, hibernation is cold initiated. But for the purpose of the talk today, I'll just refer to um, it as, as uh, estivation or overwintering um, when referring to their dormancy on land. Uh, all right, so this is our um, study area, kind of a map of that. Um, to date, most of our information about the species has really been from Washington, California, and the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which is kind of their range. Um, but the Mid-Columbia District um, began monitoring the, the pond turtles in 2009. However, uh, more intensive monitoring began in 2018, which has resulted in some pretty valuable information um, about our specific population in Mosher. So this map is all the ponds that we have performed trapping in over the years. However, right now, our current study area for that intensive monitoring um, consistently includes only nine of these ponds. Um, through our monitoring efforts, we have identified many additional ponds that are being utilized by the population that are not mapped here. 
I just wanted to kind of put it up here so you could see it. And it's important to note that this is not exhaustive and we do expect there to be turtles in, in areas between this. Um, it is primarily private land. So of all of these ponds that we've been to, only two of the ponds are on public land. And one of those ponds is only half on public land. So most of our efforts require landowner cooperation, which kind of limits our efforts and frequency of efforts. Uh, because of this, ODFW does recognize that building relationships and collaborating, collaborating with landowners is extremely important for the persistence of this population. All right, so kind of our efforts. Oops. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, ODFW started more intensive monitoring in 2018. We started estimating the population through a mark recapture study. So this requires us to um, trap at those nine ponds that I mentioned. And when we trap, we mark those um, each unique individual, and then we release them back. We then return to those same ponds within 24 hours um, and record how many turtles we had previously caught while still marking new individuals. So we performed these trap events periodically through March through August, where most of the turtles are utilizing that aquatic habitat. Um, through this, we were able to um, estimate how many turtles are in each pond and subsequently the whole population. Uh, this, uh, the trapping, while we did that, we also took morphological measurements. So we did get some of um, that data as far as like weights and shell dimensions um, where we can track growth rates and also kind of gain demographic information, how many females, males, and the, the different age classes present. Um, during the, oops, during the trapping, we also were able to put transmitters on 16 of the females. The transmitters allow us to track the turtles by emitting um, a radio pulse. You can see in the picture up there, that's Zoe, one of the interns, is tracking the turtles. Um, through the tracking, we have learned general habitat use and identified um, habitat preferences. Um, such as like where they overwinter, as well as the movement quarters from pond to pond. Um, I'll discuss this part um, a little bit later, uh, but for now, just know that the telemetry efforts are relatively new. Um, so we do have more goals beyond what I'm gonna talk about right now. Um, but we just, we, we do plan on performing resource selection analysis to help identify what types of habitat the turtles utilize uh, the most during life stages, primarily estivation and nesting. So this will help us educate landowners and make um, future management decisions. Okay, so this is our results. Um, from 2018 to 2022, we captured and marked 249 individuals. So with that and through our mark recapture study, we estimated our population to be 171 turtles with a 95% confidence interval between 103 and 303. Uh, one of the ponds, of the ponds that we studied for more than two years, we saw a decrease in five and an increase in two. Um, but we continue to encounter around 150 individuals each year um, during our trapping events. In our most dense pond, there are upwards of 40 turtles, so you can kind of get an idea of how many turtles are in each pond. Um, that's definitely our most dense. There's a lot of turtles there. They're very visible. Um, yeah, and sometimes something to consider here is that turtles under the age of three were not frequently captured. Um, but they were observed. So even though we weren't capturing them, we we still know that they're there. Um, and then as far as our telemetry efforts um, and their movements, we learned that turtles that have access to permanent ponds began uh, estimating significantly later. And even um, our last 
telemetry tracking event in November, some of them were still in the pond. Um, so we're still going to monitor that, monitor that and see when they start estimating. Uh, our earliest estimation occurred in August, and these ponds began drying up in July. So we kind of expected them to um, start that estimation. We also noticed that the turtles in these drying ponds utilize adjacent ponds more than the, the turtles that were in the permanent ponds, even though those adjacent ponds also dried up. Um, the greatest distance traveled by a transmitted female was about 300 meters. However, it is important to consider that we didn't have any transmitters on males, and males typically in the population of um, Western pond turtles do move more. So it's not a represent, not a good representation of how far these turtles can actually travel between ponds or habitats. Um, and then just continuing, um, our, our knowledge of their behavior within the pond is really limited. So the telemetry, even using the telemetry efforts, we really only got a good idea of how they use their habitat outside of the pond because we were able to track them. Um, in our preliminary telemetry analysis, we found that the turtles utilize shorelines, floating logs, emergent rocks, and basking, um, or for basking, which is also important for their thermal regulation. You can see one of our females here um, on that um, basking log and that little bump kind of to her right is a hatchling that probably emerged that spring. And this was from um, late summer. Um, we had initially planned to perform a resource selection ratio analysis for estivation sites, but we decided due to our, um, our small sample size, we decided to instead simply identify characteristics of these sites. However, as I mentioned earlier, we do plan to do a more sophisticated assessment of the estivation sites that will provide statistical support for our observations here. So kind of for our observations, we observed that the turtles preferred shrubs, oak overstory, or conifer overstory with a dense understory. So they utilized the leaf litter um, and cover that the shrubs offered for protection during estivation. These are a couple pictures of the just some of the turtles that I tracked. The turtle on the left was in about four to six inches under leaf litter in a mature oak overstory. So there wasn't a lot of like shrubs, but there was a really thick um, layer of oak litter. The turtle on the right was under two to four inches of oak leaf litter within a thick bunch of oats. So like a small patch of a bunch of oats. Um, she was further covered by poison oak and small oak saplings. I uncovered both of these turtles for the photos. They're very difficult to see, but if you look really closely, you can see like a little bit of gray, like a dark <laughs> gray, but they are good at um, hiding. This is why telemetry is really important because we could never find these turtles without that tracking capability. Uh, the common shrubs of choice for the, the turtles we, we found were snowberries, willows, and like I said, poison oak. Um, we even had one turtle bury itself under a really big balsam root. Um, so that was kind of interesting. We hadn't seen that before. Um, we also observed no turtles using grassland as estivation sites. Um, and this was, this was kind of interesting because despite being a large component of the upland habitat available to the turtles, they didn't choose it um, over other habitats, as I've mentioned. Um, regardless of the overstory, a dense leaf litter or dense understory was observed at every site. So in most of the sites, um, oak litter or oak overstory or yeah, oak overstory were present. Um, in future efforts, we will want to identify whether these turtles disproportionately utilize oaks compared to other tree species. Um, we just haven't done that yet. So these are all just observations as far as right now and won't be used to in management decisions yet, but we do plan on doing more intensive um, research. It is one of our research questions. Um, 
and we'll be trying to answer that in future years. All right, and that's all for you. Any questions? <laughs>